I want to get right back right into uh, the dispenser survey, the 2016 dispenser survey. I've been doing these since 1995. Um, my predecessor, my mentor, uh, Marge Scafty, was doing them back into the 1970s. Um, but uh, we we have been doing doing this for some time. Um, the 2016 dispenser survey has some really interesting points to it, and and um, I think uh, you'll see through uh, through the data that you know our industry really is changing pretty rapidly, both in terms of technology and price offerings, um, technology channel competition, and importantly, the consumer, as I as I talked about with Brian uh, Taylor's uh, uh, comment, are driving our market. Dispensing professionals have an extremely logical way of doing a, a good, better, best system, um, and, and I will give you the specific pricing on that. There exist methods for a lot more um, low-cost hearing aids, and a lot of low-cost hearing aids are, are now being offered in um, dispensing practices. Um, and I'll give you some, the, some numbers for that. And um, some of these low-cost options are also being unbundled or um, ha having a pay-as-you-go kind of system, uh, you know, unbundling of products from services. And, um, and some of them have no service at all, which is uh, a good uh, matter of debate among us as well. Uh, the survey was conducted, the 2016 survey was conducted in late February and early March of uh, this year by the Hearing Review and the Red Hill Group in Irving, California. Um, the previous 2013 survey was conducted in October and November of 2013. So although it's, we're calling it the 2013 survey and the, and the uh, 2016 survey, these two surveys were actually just a little bit more than two years apart, two, month, two years and a couple, you know, three months apart. Um, a total of 600 qualified survey respondents uh, were tallied, uh, 739 opened the survey, um, 680 started the survey and went, and went through uh, parts of the survey. Of those 680, about 80 were um, from everything from charitable organizations to um, uh, different countries, uh, including Canada, and, and, and those were called out of the, out of the survey sample. Um, some distinguishing features from this survey from other surveys, um, the, the mix of dispensing audiologists and hearing and some specialists were the same basically of all the, uh, all the other surveys, 62% dispensing audiologists, 33% hearing and some specialists. I believe that's fairly representative of the field. 40% um, owners and co-owners, 58% uh, employees. That's usually on most of our dispenser surveys. It's the other way around. So on other dispenser surveys that we've had, um, it's usually been around 60% owners and co-owners. Same with fem uh, males and females, 60% female on this survey. Usually that splits a little bit more 50-50. 51% of the respondents uh, Worked in a, a private practice setting. 19% in a medical or a, a medical clinic or a hospital. 15% um, in a retail setting, and 11% in a physician's office. One thing I want to make really clear about our surveys is that they're weighted to independent private practices, um, the, and and that reflects hearing reviews readership. Um, the, we have. A, this was emailed to our readership, about 13, 14,000 people. Um, and 50% 50, 50 of the respondents, 51% of the respondents said that, uh, self-reported that they were independent practice owners, while 20% said that they um, were independent but belonged to a buying group and network. And that's, that's uh, um, quite a bit more than is, is certainly represented in our market. Uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, manufacturers would probably say that there's probably, in terms of true independence, without b being obligated to uh, financing with uh, hearing aid manufacturers and this and that, maybe 25 to 33, maybe 25 to actually up to 40 percent or so. However, Wayne did a great uh, blog, and again, it depends on your definition of, um, Wayne Staub did a great blog, it depends on your definition of independent that showed that it was about 50 percent there too. So um, it, I think it depends on your definition of what, an, what a true independent is. Um, the average prices in our survey are, uh, are uh, 
are weighted by two different ma uh, metrics. One is, is the um, uh, Hearing Industries Association's statistics uh, from the manufacturers in terms of the uh, styles of hearing aids. And um, that's what you see here, the 2004. And the other is, is um, how many uh, hearing aids are coming from your premium line, your mid-level line, and your economy line. But uh, you know, I, I, wanna, I just want to show the progression of the past uh, 12 years of, the, um, of hearing aid styles. And if you look in 2004, uh, the RIC and the RITE uh, in green there was just getting started. I mean, the, the Feely brothers had just started up uh, Cibatec, and um, I don't think even Natan ba Bauman was around with his Vivisound uh, hearing aid. So, uh, you know, you see um, kind of how hearing aid, the hearing aid styles had been for the last 15 years, 20 years since the, uh, since the ITE revolution. Then, five years later, Look what happened, RICs and RITEs um, made up 25% of the market. Traditional BTs exploded because you had the resound air and, um, and, the, open, and the open fit uh, revolution. You also had the, the uh, slim tubes and the, you know, the invisible cosmetics for uh, BTEs. So that, that was really a, a, you know, a, a, a sea change when it comes down to it. And today what you see is that um, at least in the, uh, in the total market, 58% of the uh, RICs, 58% uh, of all the hearing aids dispensed are R RICs and ITEs. They've cut into the traditional BTE um, segment. And um, so I I'm gonna go off on a little rant here, but you know, when you read like the IOM or the PCAST reports, uh, they're saying that the, that Hearing aid technology hasn't changed much. Well, it's, it's, it's changed completely in terms of styles of hearing aids. And then when you, look, when you bring into fa things like factors like wireless and 2.4 gigahertz, which is, which is coming across basically, I would, I would guess it'll come across all of the lines. Um, digital noise reduction, frequency transposition or frequency lowering, tinnitus remediation. Um, you know, wind noise and uh, directional microphones, and then the array of different uh, remote mics and and things like that. I'm not quite sure where people are coming off saying that that our technology is stagnant or um, uh, hasn't been moving along. And I'd be a fool to uh, uh, to argue with anything that Robin Cox says, but but you know. It, Robin was very, very plain spoken in this study that she did where she basically showed that economy aids don't have um, any real objective benefit, uh, um, or I'm sorry, premium aids have, have no objective benefit over economy aids. And, and that's, you know, I, I accept that. I think that's, that's a kind of a good thing for us because it's an egalitarian type of system. I mean, you, you can get a, a low product end or a high product end and you, and you benefit the same way. If you want all the bells and whistles, that's, that's a good thing too. And you can opt for the, the premium end. But really the difference, what Robin's study shows is that the difference is in what you guys do, what, the fitting of the hearing aid. I mean, that's where, that's where the value of, uh, of the fitting comes from. And that's why if, if you have a dispenser who knows what they're doing and fits an economy aid, it's going to give the same type of, uh, as long as it has good electroacoustic uh, parameters, it's going to give the same kind of benefit that the, um, that the premium aid does. So, okay, so there's my rant, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I get off on that. The, um, uh, we asked survey respondents what percentage of of hearing aids they dispense from the various levels of, of hearing aids. And, and throughout this presentation, you'll see that the premium, uh, premium hearing aid products are in green, the uh, mid-level is in red, and the, uh, and the economy is in, is in blue. And here um, in 2016, the uh, respondents said that 38% of their hearing aids came from the premium line, 40% came from the mid-level lines, and 22% um, came from the economy line. And that was really pretty close, almost the same as the 2013 survey. I included the 2005 survey here just as kind of a historical um, uh, note. But you can see that they're, uh, that they're pretty close. Now, um, if you talk to a manufacturer, 
I think the manufacturers will say, well, that's totally different. I mean, and remember, these are, these are independent, you know, these, these are independent practice owners. So I think the manufacturers would say overall in the industry, um, you see more like 30% uh, uh, from the economy level, more like 50% from the mid-level and 20% and from uh, the premium level. And that's a long way of saying that I think that when we do our averages and our weightings um, in this survey, that we're getting the independence point of view um, and it inflates the average price a little bit more than you would see in, in, the, in the true market. Unbundling and unbundling, or bundling and unbundling, this has stayed, at least in, in, according to our surveys, it stayed virtually the same um, for an awful long time. Uh, bundle, 79% uh, of dispensers bundled their, their, uh, uh, their products and services. Um, in the 2013 survey, 83% did. There's really no difference there. And then just for historical interest, interest in 2005, 81% bundled. This is the uh, slide that, you, or a permutation of this slide you'll see over and over again in this presentation. Um, the median, the, we'll just cut right to the quick, the median prices by technology level in, in the 2016 survey was economy was $1,500, mid-level pricing was $2,250, and premium pricing was $3,000. Um, it pretty much cuts across all of the styles of hearing aids, and the average, total average hearing aid price in 2016 was $2,369. I've rounded up to $2,370 here. So that, um, you'll, you'll, you'll see this um, reoccur in some of the slides. Uh, here is uh, the next four slides kind of cut, uh, kind of dice it up a little bit. But these are, this is the ASPs for all of the styles across the, um, across the gamut of, of the five different styles of hearing aids. And what you find is that really between the styles, there's only a difference of $109. So again, um, the price, le the technology levels mean a lot more than, than the, uh, the styles in terms of price. And just to, just to prove this to you, um, the average ASP, uh, the ASP of uh, premium aids was $3,008 with a uh, median, as I showed before, of $3,000. The ASPs for mid-level aids were um, $2,256 with a median of $2,250, as I showed before. And the ASPs of economy aids uh, were $1,491 with a median of $1,500. So again, it's a pretty clear and logical good, better, best system, $1,500, dollars $3,000 um, for uh, in a traditional good, better, best system. Um, and if you look at it, it looks like I doctored this, but I swear the Red Hill Group uh, did, did this. It, the, all of the levels are, uh, are $750 apart. Pretty easy to remember. Let's, let's oh, I'm sorry. Go. No, we didn't, and that's a, that's a great question. Um, th that that would be uh, interesting to do. It, um, we didn't have time to do that, but um, I'm hoping to do that in my article. Um, let's look at price differences between 2016 and 2013, and some really interesting things emerged here. The the most interesting one, as you see here, is that economy, and these are nominal prices, not adjusted for inflation. The uh, uh, the prices for um, economy aids decreased by 108 to 212 dollars, while the um, prices for mid-level aids went up by 41 to 72 dollars, and premium aids went up by 20 to 25 dollars. And look at that it, it, the RICs in the premium, um, it, you know, the, the premium prices went up a fair amount, but where you're more, you know, in the RIC RITE class. They went up a lot less, and, and remember that's about 60% of the market. So there's and there's a lot of competition there from big box and everything else. So that's a, that's an uh, uh, interesting finding. Again, when you look at nominal ASPs, the um, it, it, when when you do the percentages, economy went down by about 10%, uh, mid-level went up by 3%, uh, 
premium by 4%, and the average was almost exactly the same. In fact, it was uh, $6 difference in, in terms of the nominal price of the hearing aids from uh, 2016 to 2013. When you adjust for CPI, uh, the, the, for inflation, um, economy went down by 12%, uh, and then um, it went up by 1% to 2% for mid-level and premium aids, and in all, it went down by 1.5%. Um, by and, and analysts have been saying that hearing aid prices overall have been, uh, ASPs have been declining, but we haven't really seen that in dispenser surveys so much. Remember, it's, it's mostly reflective of private practice practitioners, but maybe now we're starting to see a little bit of um, ASP erosion in, the, uh, in, in private practice. So, you know, a note to PCAST and IOM, markets do respond. Uh, and th this, is a, this is a graph of, of unit sales um, taken, for, and it's an extrapolation from hearing, instrument or, uh, uh, hearing Industries Association statistics. But in it, um, you know, we've estimated that uh, the red is where Costco is, and they've grown by about 20 to 25% um, for the last seven years at least. I haven't, there's no way that I can get uh, statistics for Costco this year, but um, I think they've, they've, they've uh, done at least that for this year, uh, 2015 rather. In the meantime, VA has also um, grown very, very quickly in, in uh, ensuing years. They're up to 22% of the market. Costco's probably 11% of the market. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, so uh, the, the traditional dispensing outlets are under um, pressure, and I think some of the pricing is uh, reflective of some of some of the uh, pressures that that uh, they're responding to. You know, whether it's big box, VA, online real retailers, insurance, um, PSAPs, hearables, uh, or or whatnot. I'm not going to uh, dwell on this slide, but this is a a history of the ASPs of, um, from all, all the magazine surveys that that have been done in the last, uh, uh, you know, since 1980. And what you basically, the important thing to note here is that in 2004, um, hearing, aids, hearing aid sales really started flattening out. Uh, they dipped a little bit, but um, mostly just uh, flattened out. Um, those orange uh, boxes um, underneath are, uh, are market track statistics. Um, for the average price, and remember, market track doesn't take into account, our surveys don't take into account free or discounted hearing aids. Market track uh, did, and so there's always a, a you know a three to four hundred um, dollar differential there. We should also note that between 1994 and 2004, he, it, that was the the DSP revolution. Hearing aid prices dub basically doubled. So, um, you know, there was, there was a lot of movement in price at that point. And during, um, just before that time, binaural hearing, we had a binaural hearing aid revolution where um, back in the 80s, uh, the, the binaural market penetration was, uh, you know, 24% of the patients had binaural fittings, but by um, 2000, 72% did. In 2016 and in 2013 surveys, 84% um, of, uh, of the patients were being fitted binaurally. So, you know, the, the dispensers have been reacting to uh, the market, I think, and this graph shows uh, the, the 2016 and 2013 surveys, 2016 in red and um, 2013 in, in, uh, in orange. And we asked people, what's the lowest priced hearing aid that, that you offer in your practice? And the most common lowest priced hearing aid offered in the practice was between $900 and $1,200. Um, in fact, uh, two, two in five, 41% uh, of practices offered a device less than $900 and one in five offered one for less than $500. Um, the average price of that lowest cost device was $1,010. The median price of that lowest cost device was $995. So when you look at it in terms of our, the good, better, best system uh, uh, before, I think there's a real logical um, uh, system, uh, logical structure to, uh, to the pricing system of the average uh, dispensing practice. We, a we also asked, um, 
does your lowest priced hearing aid come with all the services provided uh, with the, that come with a regular standard aid? 78% of the um, of the practice uh, of the respondents said that it did. 22% said that it does not doesn't come with at least all of the services. When we asked about this lowest priced hearing aid and how they were marketed, um, about three quarters of the survey respondents said uh, that, um, tw or 74% said that. The, they were marketed as hearing aids with all the services included. 20% said that they were uh, marketed as hearing aids but unbundled or in a pay-as-you-go type of system. Uh, and meanwhile, 6% didn't, uh, didn't have any service. 3% um, uh, of them were marketed as hearing aids with no service. 1% um, hear were marketed as, as hearables. 2% were marketed as PSAPs but... Um, that brings up some interesting questions since PSAPs aren't, uh, by FDA definition, aren't supposed to be for uh, hearing loss. Well, we can debate that later. Um, and I just wanted to bring you, bring you back to, you know, um, I don't mean to pick on Costco. I think at the end of the day, we're going to be thanking Costco for, for, their, uh, for their entrance in the market. You can tarn feather me or beat me up uh, afterwards. But um, uh, Costco, Costco is obviously a, a formidable competitor in terms of price. And um, this is kind of how the, the, uh, the traditional dispensers line up against the Costco prices. Uh, you, you know the the uh, top end Costco uh, products are about fifteen hundred dollars. The Kir the uh, Kirkland um, RIC is about eighteen hundred dollars, and that comes in with you know, pretty close to our economy aid um, uh, price scheme there. But you know it's interesting to note that the that lowest priced hearing aid that most dispensers are offering, the nine ninety five, um, the average is uh, ten ten. Um, is pretty close to the 100 bucks more than the lowest price that Costco is offering too. So that, that's interesting. I, I think Shigata, um, Dr. Patachery calls it the. Co he's got one that he calls the Costco killer. But there's a there's a number of people who have in their practices um, low price devices that are competing with with uh, Costco. Uh, question. Yeah. But you're not comparing apples to apples there on the right. premium products because their premium product is. I. You're, I I I I understand the you, you know. Repeat the question. Oh, um, he said. I'm sorry. He said that that their premium product is is outdated. So what what you're saying is that, uh, um, am I understanding you correctly? In that the uh, that it's a it's a generation behind. Yeah. It's yeah. At least one or two generations right. behind. Right. Right. So their premium product they can offer it lower. Right. Right. And if we have something. Right, right. Yep. Right. 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 So it, even better for for private. The, the the comment was that that their 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 technology is lagging behind. So um, you're even at a at a better competitive standpoint. Thank you. But um, you know, Costco is a, is a tough competitor. When we asked people what your number one and number two competitor was in the in the in the dispenser survey, um, big box came out quite a, quite a bit higher than um, than any of the others. Chain retail and independent practice has always been um, there, and then you see the see the rest here. Um, we just had a, a, a seminar by or a webinar uh, sponsored by or a courtesy of Care Credit. That was from Dan Qual, and he had Dan in this webinar has a really interesting um, uh, way of of doing per, of unbundling or limited unbundling of pricing, using what he calls the per clinic uh, the per clinic hour of each individual provider in your practice, and basically what he says, and, and this is on our website um, of the it's a half an hour web it's less than half an hour uh, webinar, but what Dan talks about is taking the gross margin of each of these practitioners, which is the total revenue minus their cost of goods, and then dividing it by their clinical hour. And then what you get is kind of the, the nut that, you've, that you have to make from that, um, from that per clinical hour. And you can pair it with um, 
basically any device, so whether it's a hearing aid or, or hypersound or anything else, and, and come up with at least a logical type of pricing structure for your practice. And so my point is here that there are a lot of interesting um, ways of, uh, of structuring your pricing and your costs to offer low cost devices. I also want to uh, mention payment, uh, uh, what, you know, following Randy's presentation, uh, you know, I think financing and, and, uh, and that type of thing, whether it's care credit or other financing companies, are not uh, used probably as, as much as they should be. I mean, look at 50% of the um, of patients are using a credit card to purchase the hearing aid, and, and a lot of them are going to be undergoing interest there as well. So, um, you know, I think financing is, is uh, something that really should be talked about through the patient journey. 29% uh, uh, use cash and check, and 8% um, used uh, in-house uh, billing options. Well, I can make a comment on that slide. Other markets in which care credit uh, had, uh, operates at a similar price point to hearing, 40% of consumers take advantage of special financing. And we even see that with our sister companies that do furniture purchases, uh, you know, uh, electronics, et cetera. 40% sort of seems to be the benchmark. Um, but in the hearing space, to your point, we see about only about 15% of penetration. And that suggests that financing is used more as sort of a last ditch effort to close the sale as opposed to a proactive method to get the patient to come in and to purchase a higher rate. Uh, within, yes, yeah, so, so right. one that I specifically work in is LASIK market, and that's about $2,000 a month. Um, we have a lot of providers that, that want to come in and take the 60% of the but then that is, I think, maybe they're even too aggressive, right? But overall, the market, care credit finances about one out of every five LASIK procedures done in the country. And of course, there's some other competitors out there, but uh, um, like I said, it, it's across all the other spectrums of Thank you, Matt. And uh, um, before I, I conclude here, I also want to re remind everybody that it's obviously, you know, the hearing aid purchases aren't all about price. Um, and, uh, you know, we asked people uh, regarding first time potential users, what was the reason why they, they declined to purchase? And actually for the first time in a, in a as far as I can tell in a, a dispenser survey, um, cost came out number two. 34% um, of respondents said that the patient wasn't ready. Um, you know, and, and that can be a lot of different reasons, and probably including costs, right? But, um, but uh, cost was mentioned in, in uh, 20 per, 28%. And then you can see the others, no insurance coverage, denial, some a lot of the other things that market track is, has uh, tracked throughout the ages here. So... The key points, I think, the, the, the executive summary, I guess, of, uh, of the dispenser survey, and I'll get into more detail in my article in July, but contrary to IOM and PCAST, you know, I think our industry is really changing rapidly, both in terms of technology and price offerings, and you guys are, are feeling it. Um, technology and channel competition and consumers, particularly consumers, are driving our market. Dispensing professionals have an extremely logical way of a good, better, best system, at least in total. And I realize some of you might have four price points and, and, and whatever, but, um, but uh, you know, in general, there's a, there's a, a logical way that, that, uh, that the hearing aids are being offered. Although the average selling price of hearing aids in a private practice has remained the same in the last two to, th two to three years, the economy hearing aids have dropped by 10% uh, in nominal and 12% in inflation-adjusted um, uh, ASPs. There are lower cost options being offered. Uh, you know, nine hundred ninety-five dollar hearing aids in in uh, in practices, and some of these low cost options come with unbundled uh, charges or no service at all. Um, in six percent of the cases, there exist methods for offering more lo low cost uh, options. And again, I would encourage you to uh, to uh, tune into the webinars that we've had. Um, that were courtesy of care credit, and, and um, there exist methods for offering more low-cost options um, in this cost-plus type of thing, as well as financing.